This is Bible Academy. We are in 1 John, finishing up chapter 1 today. Now before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege and opportunity that you have given us to study your word. We ask that our hearts and our minds be open and ready to receive your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. By way of review, in our last lesson, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, we looked at the second false claim of the false teachers and John's counterclaim. Verse 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, so that he forgives us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, now you can see with greater depth why it is important that we continue to confess our sins. And I remind you of it, as well as myself, at the beginning of each lesson. This is where we learned how essential it is for the believers to make sure their sins are confessed so they can return and then maintain their fellowship with God. Now, Last time I drew a chart, I want to develop that a little bit more and give you some uh, better understanding of what I was trying to say. <clears throat> this is this is a cross that represents the moment you were saved. I'm just going to write in here, saved. At the moment you were saved, you were placed into union with Christ. Now let's just talk about that for a moment because what we're really concerned about is what we're going to see down here in this circle. Right now we're talking about, let's just call it, the base fellowship. This is what I'm going to call it, base fellowship. By that I mean when you became a Christian, you were placed into a relationship with God. It was based upon faith, saving faith. Let's write that up there. Write some of the key terms that are related to this. Based upon saving faith, you believed in the work and the person of Jesus Christ. Before God, you are viewed as cleansed of your sin, forgiven. You're in the family of God. Now, however, we have a, though we have a family relationship with God, we can call that familial if you want to. We have to still live on this earth in sinful bodies. I use the word permanent. Now, by that I don't mean eternal security. All right, don't get that confused. Because I want something to contrast with the temporal. Temporal is related to time. All right? So when I say permanent, as a Christian, you are set in union with Christ. As long as you're a Christian, you never lose that. All right? That's what I mean in the sense of permanent. I didn't want to leave you confused from my last lesson. But you do not lose that as long as you continue in your saving faith, maintaining your faith. Now, in that status, again, you are saved, forgiven of your sins, 
every sin, past, present, and future, you are cleansed before God. That's how you appear and will appear once you die. But in the meantime, we have this little time we have to spend on earth. Our temporal fellowship. Okay? This is referring to this circle here. You know, in fact, just to make it clear, I'm going to put it in there. Oops, I lost my circle. But I can fix that right quick. <clears throat> All right, this is the place of fellowship with God. Now, the reason I chart this out like this is just so you can mentally grasp some of these concepts a little better. Uh, this can be confusing as well as uh, uh, complicated. And I don't mean to make it so, but this is the, about as simple as I can make it for you. So, you're saved, you're still on earth, you're still in your sinful body. This is you down here walking on earth. You become a Christian, that's the first time you experience fellowship with God. You're called into fellowship. That means not only are you related to God now, that includes your union with Christ, your special close relationship with God, but you are to be walking in fellowship. Think of some of the terms for this fellowship. It's been called light, right? Uh, being in fellowship means you're walking in the light. We're going to see several other terms come up that also include this concept. We'll get to those in a few moments, but I want to get through this chart first. To stay in the light. Well, let's put it this way. To get out of the light, you sin. To get back into the light, you confess. It's that simple. Down here, you are out of fellowship. This is also darkness. We can also add, bring in some of Paul's teaching, you're under the control of the what? Of the sinful nature. And fellowship Excuse me, I said that backwards. In darkness, you are out. No, that's true. <laughs> I said it right. Under the control of the sinful nature. All right? In fellowship, you're also going to be in control by the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is not in this passage. In fact, he's hardly talked about in John. He is some. But right now we're talking about uh, fellowship in regards to the Father and the Son. Walking in the light, not sinning. You maintain this fellowship by not sinning. God is light. He is pure. He is truth. So all these elements you meet with in fellowship. All right, another thing, uh, your permanent union with Christ in the sense of you don't lose that as long as it's, it's based, it's faith-based, all right, faith-based, you keep your faith, you keep your union with Christ, all right. Now, faith is certainly involved in your temporal fellowship, all right, however, as we're going to see at least five times, and I say that five times in the sense of five major uses of the way John uses this, is based upon, we've already seen this, not sinning. And the other way he puts it is basically obedience. And of course, that amounts to basically the same thing, right? If you're not sinning, you should be obedient. If you're obedient, you're not sinning. So understand these differences. 
John is emphasizing and teaching this fellowship right here. All right. This is John's teaching. So, kind of picture this chart in your mind when you think about being with God in fellowship or out of God. And let me just add this. Uh, I may make some adjustments to this later on. I mean, it's more complicated than it was 20 years ago. And, uh, but it's also, I'd say, deeper. And uh, I could add probably more accurate in the betrayal here. Now, one other thing I'll mention, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky to understand. As a Christian, you're going to grow. So what I want to do, I'm going to draw this bigger circle. This is your temporal fellowship over here. You're going to grow. Let's say this line I'm going to draw here is your Christian growth. All right? You're going to gradually grow. That's assuming you're living a normal Christian life. You're going to grow. This is, indicates growth, pointing upward. All right? When you sin... You're going to knock yourself off your growth line. Let's just put it that way. All right? And you're not going to be growing. Hopefully you're not growing in your sin. But you're not going to be growing. Now, that's what sin did. Confess. Does that mean you go right back to the point you were? Well, that probably depends how long you're out of fellowship. And how much damage has been done. But if you're going to continue to grow, you need to get back in fellowship with God. Okay? So you're in fellowship, and at the same time, you're growing. You're not going to grow when you're out of fellowship because you're basically in sin. You're going the opposite direction. If you spend several years in sin, you'll probably revert back to probably a baby. Hopefully you don't move in apostasy because then you're in really deep trouble. Okay? So this is where Christian growth comes in. So let me just stay, uh, state these principles. In fact, I want to put them on the board for you. This is a, a very brief five principles of what we've just seen in this chart. One, when you were saved, you were placed into union with Christ. At the same time, you received the righteousness of God. That is your permanent, and I use the word enduring also, status before God as long as you keep Believing in Jesus Christ. I thought about using the term enduring instead of permanent. But that doesn't quite fit either. I, I don't really have a, a good term I'm happy with on that permanent thing. Two, the word permanent is being used in contrast to your temporal status with God in your walk with God on earth. I want to make that clear. Three, this base fellowship is faith Based, that's the small circle up above, based on saving faith and maintained through your continuing faith in Christ. Four, your temporal fellowship status is dependent on faith too, but the emphasis is on obedience and not sinning, on your walking in the light. This is our, top, our topic here, that means in this passage. Point five, we will see John repeat this general concept of fellowship. Now don't miss this. This general concept of fellowship using different words and phrases. Now I want to show you some of the things we're going to see in the next several verses. We've seen a couple of them already. He will use the phrases, as we've seen, walking in the light, fellowship with God. You maintain that by not sinning. Shortly, he'll be talking about knowing him, that is, knowing God, depending upon your obedience. It's related to fellowship. Love of God perfected, depending on your obedience. Abides in him. That's someone who walks like him, like Jesus. 
Now notice, not sinning, obedience, walking like him, are all generally the same thing. And so those phrases on the left, walking in light, fellowship with God, knowing him, love of God perfected, abides in him or abiding in him, these are generally the same thing. Now with all this said, I want to leave myself an opening here. I'm going to maybe make some adjustments to this as we move through 1 John. I haven't seen any necessary just yet, but once I get a lot more of these things sorted out and thought through, I may come up with some adjustments, but I think we're pretty solid right now. In verse 10, we look at the second false claim. We actually, we looked at this in our last lesson. Let me remind you of it. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. All right, that's the second false claim. People are saying that we don't sin. John is saying right up front, if you claim that, then you're lying. You don't have the word. Notice how he identifies with the crowd again using we and us. Obviously, it's hypothetical. He turns and, you might say, puts on his pastor's hat. When we come to the counterclaim, but first he has something to say, beginning of verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And in, when I taught this in the last lesson, you set up the priorities first. Don't sin. Don't sin. Secondly, but if you do, and there's a real possibility you're not going to live a perfect life. In fact, that's the case in everybody's life. The third point, confess it. Confess it. Don't sin, but if you do, confess it. All right. Now, the underlined portion is where we continue from our last lesson. This is the counterclaim. All right. Remember the claim, the false claim, verse 10 again. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Actually, the claim is if we have not sinned. Here's the counterclaim. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Before he talks about forgiveness, he's going to talk about the one who has provided the forgiveness. Now, the counterclaim comes with the assumption that they may sin. Now, let's think about this. They've already claimed twice they don't sin. Now, he's getting to their heads a little bit. This has the assumption that you just might sin. This is a step towards reality for these people. For someone to think that they do not sin and shut off God's truth puts them in a precarious position. John, you might say, is giving them the benefit of the doubt. If they still have room for some truth to get in, they aren't completely closed off then they should realize they just might sin. And when they do, they have Jesus Christ standing by the Father for their defense as their advocate. Now, John shifts back to the first person plural here when he says, we have an advocate. Let's talk about that term, advocate. If you study John with me, you are familiar with it. Parakletos. Yes, it's the word that we use for comforter, counselor. It means to come alongside. 
particularly as an advocate, it means to plead another's case. A counsel for defense. This is saying that Jesus is right there, not only defending our case, but he's all for us. All right? He is going to defend us because we're on solid ground. Now, Jesus is our advocate. Well, you couldn't have anyone better on your side. Listen to Romans 8.34. I should have put Romans up there. This is from Romans 8.34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. And more than that, he was raised, who is at the right hand of the Father, who also is interceding for us. Now this is quite a significant statement. It really colors in a lot of things about the advocate. First of all, the one who is our advocate is the one who died for us. And only that, he was raised. And not only that, he's the one at the right hand interceding for us. He's speaking on our behalf. He's, uh, you might say, helping us hold our ground here. What is our ground? That we trusted in Christ. This is an essential truth that these believers that John is writing need to recognize. Now, folks, these are wonderful truths and principles for us, but let's not lose sight of the context. These people who are getting this information this basic information, probably again, at least once, maybe many times in their lives, they need Jesus Christ there for them right now. John is saying he's there. It's not the case that they're not going to sin. John just saying, if you sin, Jesus is there. It's rather subtle. But it's also profound in that our advocate, Jesus Christ, the one who died for us, is also standing with the Father, pleading our case, saying, He trusted in me. He's forgiven. He's cleansed. He's all good, Father. So Jesus is there with the Father to intercede for these believers who are in the process of going off the deep end. The very one who died for them and suffered for their sins is confessing before the Father. You cannot leave Jesus Christ out of your life. So there's two or three elements here that John is trying to get through to them on. Jesus Christ is still there for you. You're still going to sin. And he's there to forgive you. Now if they were so hardened of heart, they might reject all those truths. If they weren't so hard, some of those things might get through. As our advocate, Jesus stands by in support of us in everything we should do to get right with God. And this is one of them. When we confess, he's there to say, forgiven. He's supposed to be forgiven. Right, says the Father. Our advocate is right there with the Father. He's at his right hand to step up for us when needed. Jesus Christ also in this verse is called the righteous. Let's look at it again. It's the end of the verse. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. God the Father's righteous. God the Father's holy. He's not going to have fellowship with anyone that is anything less than that. Jesus, as righteous, is perfectly qualified to go before the righteous Father and plead our case. If we sin, he is there to say we accepted the pardon through himself. And when we confess that sin as we should, he's there to make sure forgiveness comes, so to speak. Now on balance, certainly want to be fair with the Father here, and I say that 
to make it clear that God the Father is going to forgive us. But you don't want to leave Jesus Christ out of the equation, which is happening with these false teachers. They basically want to eliminate who he is, what he does for the believer, and what he has done for the believer. So on balance, we should not forget that God the Father is the one, back we, we saw back in verse 9, who's faithful and just to forgive us our sins when we confess. So both the judge, the Father, and the lawyer are righteous and they do the right thing for us. We cannot possibly lose. So Christ does not only do the right thing, but the perfect thing for us before the Father. He will make no mistakes as our advocate. He can't. And we go back to the simple fact, but important fact. Jesus is the one who died for us. God the Father is the one who sent him to die for us. So you might say, it's rigged. There's no way we're not going to be forgiven. I don't use that in a negative sense, but it's the case that in a righteous situation like this, the righteous father, the righteous son has set it up so you will always be forgiven, without a doubt. Now we learn more about Christ our advocate. John doesn't stop there. He pulls in some terms that we're going to spend some time on here. And he himself, referring to Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. This statement, well, I should say, uh, part of a sentence, verse 2, is loaded with biblical truth. Things we need to understand. Well, let's start out with the first big word we see, and he himself is the propitiation. Let's look at the doctrine of propitiation. The doctrine of propitiation. We'll go through this point by point. It's about two or three pages long, so we'll be spending some time on it. But this is one of those truths we need to get down really well. It has many applications. It's very important. That's when I make them doctrines. Some doctrines are so large, it's hard to limit them and give it a fair uh, hearing. I think we can do that on this. But you'll see how it can broaden it to something much bigger. Roman number one, introduction. A, a definition. Propitiation falls under the major category of doctrine, soteriology, or the study of salvation. Two, problem with the term. Yes, there's a problem with this term. Propitiation has been in use for many years, but may not be the best word to describe the usage here in the Greek. You'll see many translations don't even use the word. Three, propitiation means that something was done to appease or placate God for something he demanded. But the meaning is broader than that. And that's why you're going to have different translations of the word. Let's look at the word. In the Greek New Testament, the word here is hilasterion. It's the noun. A. Look at some of its usages. In the LXX, that's the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it was used for the Hebrew word equivalent to the mercy seat which was on the lid, you might even say it was the lid, 
of the Ark of the Covenant. Exodus 25:20. 20. B in Hebrews 9:5, it is the mercy seat. It's called the mercy seat. Now this is this Greek word. C in Romans 8:25, it's used for atonement for sin. So, we have all these ideas coming together. It's the mercy seat. It's where atonement for sin was provided. Now, as you look at your different modern translations, this is the note, they use similar terms related to atonement. You'll probably have about as many translations as you do um, versions of the Bible. I haven't checked them all, obviously, but you'll get the idea. All of them are related to atonement, the mercy seat, and you'll see some still use the term propitiation. Another term related, helasmas. It's also a noun. In the Septuagint, it's used for the sin offering. Ezekiel 44.27 B. In the New Testament, Jesus is called the halasmas. The verb. Three, the verb. Hilaskamai. It means a to render propitious. Luke 18, 13. B in the middle voice reflects back on the subject to render propitious to oneself. Hebrews 2.17 What I'm trying to do is show you its usage in the New Testament so we can get a definition of this word in our passage. So we come to our conclusion under C. Both noun and verb is used in relation to the Old Testament sacrifice of the bull and the blood being poured out on the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement. I said in relation to it. The mercy seat is where atonement was made. The sacrifice turned away the wrath of God, provided forgiveness and cleansing. All three of these many meanings should be included in whatever word or words we used here. And you'll see some translations like atoning sacrifice or atonement. Well, let's talk about the Old Testament sacrificial system. Now, if you've ever read the, uh, I should say, processes, because there's so many of them, depends on a number of factors. The Old Testament sacrificial system. This is very brief and very simplified. Some general comments. One, A is general comments. Roman numeral two, the Old Testament sacrificial system. A, general comments. One, different types of offerings were given for various reasons on various days and special days. Now, you're probably aware of that. Two, they also differed according to the person's station in life and his economic status. A poor person might give a pigeon. A middle class might give a lamb. All right? Three, under our topic, we are concerned about the animal offerings, which were sacrificed as burnt sin and some fellowship offerings. Not all offerings were animals, of course. Sometimes it was, could be a drink. It could be uh, some food. But here we're talking about the animal sacrificial system. Now here's the general procedure. Now listen to this. This really helps. I, I know when I first understood this, it really helped me too to understand the picture that's going on here. So B is the general procedure. This is all in Leviticus. You can read Leviticus. There's a whole lot about it. Remember, that's part of the law. That's part of the sacrificial system. One, the sinner would bring his offering to the priest and the sinner would identify with his offering by placing his hand on the offering. It's like his sin is being transferred to the offering. He brings a little lamb. Now the 
lamb as his sin. Two, the offering would be accepted to make atonement. That's the word kipper for the offer. Leviticus 1.4. Three, the offering was slaughtered. Should be an ed there. Was slaughtered and his blood was poured or splashed on the altar. Four. The blood was viewed as being the life of the animal. So when its blood was poured out on the altar, God could see that a life had been given, namely the animal. Five, the animal was a substitute for the sinful offerer, the one who brought the animal. And when God saw the blood of the animal, the person offering it was granted deferred judgment. I use the word deferred. I'll explain that as we go along. In other words, his punishment would be delayed, well, here's the explanation, until a final sacrifice was made on his behalf, that being Jesus Christ. You presented your offering as a sacrifice. God can look at that and say, okay, you're forgiven for now, but you still have judgment coming. And then when Jesus came, he wiped away that judgment because he took on your judgment. You see? It's just beautiful the way God had this done. It teaches them about them needing that ultimate sacrifice. They look forward to Christ who would be the final payment. You see? The blood teaches his life is going to be lost. In New Testament terms, blood of Christ refers to his work on the Christ. I mean on the cross. Don't ever buy into that false teaching that it was the literal blood of Christ. No, his blood, yes, he did bleed literally, but it represents his spiritual death on the cross, his receiving the punishment for our sins. That's what that refers to. Well, now we've got to talk about the Day of Atonement because that was the big day. Uh, Leviticus 16, also in Leviticus 23, 26 through 32, this is Yom Kippur, number one, the Day of Atonement, letter C, capital C, the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, 23, 26 through 32. One, this is Yom Kippur, the Day of Covering. That's what that means. Uh, Yom is the Hebrew word for day. Kippur, covering. Two, this came once a year on the tenth day of the Jewish seventh month. Three, this offering was to, listen to this, cleanse the priest, he had to be clean too, his household, and the people, and the holy place. So this is a very important sacrifice. This is done once a year to cleanse the priest, his household, the people, and the holy place. So this just about covered everything. Four, the high priest would take the blood of this slaughtered bull and enter the most holy place. That's the Holy of Holies. What was in the Holy of Holies? The Ark of the Covenant. What was on top of the Ark of the Covenant? The mercy seat. Five, he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. Six, here we come back to what we saw earlier. God would see the blood, know that an animal gave his life, and grant mercy. Isn't that beautiful? Now, Roman numeral three, the New Testament teaching, A, in relation to Jesus Christ. One, Jesus Christ became the once and for all final offering for sin. So he's the offering. Ephesians 5, 2, Hebrews 9, 26, 10, 5, and 12. So Jesus Christ is the offering, in fact, the final offering. Two, Jesus Christ became the propitiation, the sacrifice. Basically, that's saying the same thing, but we're using the terms propitiation and sacrifice. Listen to Romans 3.25. Whom God set forth as an propitiation 
by his blood, representing his death, appropriated his spiritual death. All right, don't miss that. He had to die physically too. You can't have a resurrection unless there's physical death. But his spiritual death, appropriated through faith, that's when we believe in Jesus Christ, to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. So that is the deferred judgment. That's what that's referring to. He didn't ignore the sin. He kind of passed over it. Not going to judge it right now. Okay? He sees the blood. Not going to judge it right now. That's the idea behind this. Let me read this verse again a little faster. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, appropriated through faith, that's what we do, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forgiveness of God he passed over the sins previously committed. All right, let's look at some subpoints to clarify some of these things. A. Christ's work on the cross was set forth. All right? publicly for all to see as a propitiation. Uh, that's the, in the first line, God set forth. God put this out front publicly. It historically happened. All right, hundreds of witnesses. B, by his blood, it's also in the, actually it starts the, Split in the first and second line. His blood represent his work on the cross, represents his work on the cross of receiving the penalty of all mankind's sins. See, it must be appropriated by faith by each and every person. It's one thing that God had sent his son to die for everyone. His blood cleansed everybody's sins. It's another thing to be able to apply that to yourself. That's where faith is involved. Now you begin to see how critical it is for every human being who wants to be saved to believe who Jesus was and what he did. That's all, that's, that's all the Father asked. I sent my son. Believe he came. Believe he went to the cross for you. He died and was resurrected. You believe that, you're in the family. D. God's righteousness demanded that justice take place. Someone had to die and receive the penalty of sin. Remember that. There's sin, someone pays. We would pay had it not been for Christ. He paid for everybody. He's willing to let anybody and anyone in. I use the word willing. E, only a man that was also God could do this for all the human race. You know, one man can die for another, but God to do it for the entire human race was required. He had to be the God-man. F, here we come towards the last principle. In his forbearance, God delayed any punishment until Christ went to the cross and took on that punishment. He took all the punishment. In other words, stemming from verse uh, point D to, to this one, someone had to pay. God sent his son to pay. So to clarify, G, God passing over the sin means that he delayed any punishment for sin until Christ made the payment. Until Christ made the payment. Three, here's another thing about Christ. Not only we've seen him as the advocate, we just saw him as the sacrifice. He's also the one that offered the sacrifice. Point three. 
Jesus also made the offering as high priest. Hebrews 2.17, therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. You can't be a high priest unless you're human. So that he might become a faithful and merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. He had to go to God as the priest. Had to go before God as the priest and make the offering. He did. The two most profound roles as the offerer he offered it for us and as a sacrifice he was a sacrifice for us some sub points here a Christ became a man in order to be high priest and function as a mediator between God and man B as such he was both merciful and faithful in all things pertaining to God He was there for us. He was there for the Father. See, as such, he made a propitiation for the sins of the people. He made atonement. Um, in the picture here, it's like Jesus' blood was poured out on the mercy seat. That's the picture. Um, he fulfilled what the animals temporarily did. He gave his life to provide forgiveness, cleansing, propitiation for the sins of the people. So point four, I sum them both up. Jesus Christ is both the perfect high priest who made the offering and was also the offering, the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God. Now you get the idea when when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. So that is the New Testament teaching in relation to Jesus Christ. Now let's look at it in relation to mankind. One, Jesus Christ is the propitiation for the sin of everyone in the world. First John 2, 2, our verse. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and only for ours only, but also for the whole world. So to put this in our context, not only for you believers who have strayed away, but for those all around you. He died for them too. He died for those false teachers. A. Christ is the atonement, the covering, sacrifice that met God's demands of justice. Now remember, this is in relation to mankind. God demanded justice. He's going to demand justice for our sins too. B, this means that God can turn away his wrath without violating his own character. Remember, God said, or God is thinking, someone has to pay. That's what his righteousness and his justice demands. You sin, you break my law, you're going to pay for it. You have to. I'm the God of the universe. I control all of this. C, at the same time, it provided both forgiveness and cleansing necessary for one to know and to come into a relationship with the Holy God. Don't miss those last words. For one to know and come into a relationship with the Holy God. Leviticus 4.26, 4.35b, compared with Ephesians 1.7, Colossians 1.14, Hebrews 9.22. You want this to really sink in? Uh, look up some of those verses for yourself. Point two, in relation to mankind, God so loved mankind that he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Here's the only other time this same word comes up, still in 1 John 4.10. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Of course, we'll spend some time on that verse when we get there. Roman numeral four in terms of action. Kind of just sums them up briefly. Let me see. That's it, I believe. Okay. In terms of action, 
A, towards sin, expiated sin. Sin is canceled out. Two, it's wiped away. Three, it's made amends for. Those are just three related terms that have to do with what propitiation did. B, toward the believer. Forgiveness and cleansing of sin. We could also say turned away, turned away wrath. Toward God, it pleased him, it satisfied him. Righteous demands were, are met. Justice is done. It is complete. Now just to show you some of the various translations, I got some of them here. The word propitiation is used in the New American Standard, King James, New King James, ESV, uh, Bible and Basic English, the Old Authorized, ASV. Toning sacrifices, uh, atoning sacrifices used by the NIVs, that is uh, both uh, years, the Net and the Web Bible. I think that's World English Bible. Okay, that covers the doctrine of propitiation. Now, let's go back and look at our verse. We still have some time left here. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Christ did the satisfactory work to so please God in his justice and righteousness that God can turn away his wrath from every person who accepts the substitutionary atonement of Christ on his own behalf through faith. This is what this amounts to. Jesus Christ's death on the cross also provided an atoning sacrifice. That is, he both purified and cleansed the believer and provided forgiveness. Now John, um, excuse me, uh, John, right, makes a contrast one that makes an important point. At the end of our verse, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. There's no way around that. Christ is the propitiation, not just for believers, not just for those who are saved, but his atonement was for the entire populated earth, meaning everyone. Everyone who's ever going to live. The work of Christ on the cross went to the extent of turning God's wrath and cleanse everyone from sin. Everyone's a sinner. Everyone is guilty. Everyone is deserving of death. But God in his love had Jesus Christ die for all their sin by taking on the punishment of everyone's sin. So the only thing left for any person to do is to trust in Christ. Now some argue that Christ died and paid only for the sins of the elect. This is called limited atonement. Again, some argue that Christ died and paid only for the sins of the elect. They call this limited atonement. But here's a clear case where John contrasts, now listen, just believers, which is would be the limited atonement view, with that of the whole world, which makes it unlimited atonement. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 together. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. Well, let's do a summary. Uh, you might have been expecting this. First of all, let's look under the uh, category of fellowship. 
I didn't originally intend to put this on the board like this, but I think that's the way I can do it. So here we go. Fellowship. Now let's try to put all these thoughts together, and this is what we'll close with. First John 1, 1 John tells his audience that they should not sin. This should not become a habit and that it becomes your way of life. Now let me just ask you a question. What happens if it does? Yes, you'll be living in darkness. You'll be living in sin. Not to mention, you'll start getting divine discipline. Two, once you start down that path, you will lose your fellowship with God, your life with God, living for Him, in obedience for Him, will move into the background and then fade away. Did you get that? Pretty soon, you'll find that, well, I'm not going to obey him there either, or there either, or there either, and pretty soon it just fades away. Obedience goes out of your life. And this is happening with these believers who have left John's fold. Three, salvation is not lost. Let me make that clear. Salvation is not lost. But the intimacy and closeness all believers should have to God the Father and their Lord Jesus is gone. Four. These believers began the walk away by taking it in some false teaching, taking in some false teaching. By that I mean listening, learning, believing it. These believers began the walk away walk away from God by taking in some false teaching that took them down the path toward heretical teaching and soon they may enter into the dangerous state of apostasy and falling away. They're not there yet. Five. They are not at that point and John does not even discuss it just yet. After John makes it clear that they should not be sinning, he provides for them what they should know if they do sin. This includes all believers. In doing so, he talks about Christ, our advocate. Our next set of summary. One, we have the best advocate in the entire universe. Jesus Christ, the righteous, standing for us before God the Father to speak on our behalf. Two, Jesus could say such things as, now this is in front of the Father, this person is in our family, Father. He's called, elect, and justified. We cannot stop loving him. Three, when believers get away from God like this, they need to be brought back into line. That is where divine discipline comes in, and God will punish us to bring us around. John doesn't mention this. You know, really, you often don't have to mention it. Because believers who have any light at all left will know that's why things are difficult. Four, we're not punished for our sins, but our discipline to get us back in line with the Lord. Five, if we do confess them, Excuse me, if we do not confess them, or we cover them up, or do not take responsibility and the resultant guilt that's going to come with it, we refuse to see what it is, the discipline intensifies. Six, once we confess, the Father says, forgiven, cleansed, case closed. Forgiven, cleansed, case closed. And Jesus never loses a case. Seven. So we have an advocate in heaven, Jesus Christ the righteous. And by the way, we learned this in John. If you study that with me, we have an advocate within us, the Holy Spirit. John 15, 26 and 16, 7. What makes Jesus the perfect advocate for us is also the fact that he is the offerer. Hebrews 2, 17 and the one offered for our sins. We just studied that. Christ the propitiation, our last set of points here. Did I move it off the board? I hope not. No, we're good. One, he is the propitiation for our sins. Two, 
He is the atoning sacrifice, our substitute. Three, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5, 1. There's your reconciliation. Four, while we were sinners, he died for us, Romans 5, 8. Five, we are declared righteous through his blood and saved from his wrath, Romans 5, 9. Six, he provided reconciliation with the Father, Romans 5.12. In addition, God is for us and did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, Romans 8.32. Eight, so the Father will not condemn us. Nine, certainly the Son will not, that is, not condemn us. He's the one who died for us and is interceding for us, Romans 8.34. And ten, our final point, Jesus Christ is the propitiation for the entire world. This one more thing to close on a lighter but true note. Any Christian uh, or not, He's not even a Christian who claims to not sin or claim they're perfect. The very fact that they say that reveals they're sinners by that lie and that they're not perfect. Well, we'll pick up here next time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's been another great lesson in learning your truth, your word. Uh, some very important things for us as Christians to understand, to not only keep ourselves close in fellowship with you, but perhaps to help others who have drifted away. Challenge us with these things. In Jesus' name, amen.